Hello, thank you guys so much for turning out. We're excited to see you all here. Thank you to the panelists for being here. My name is Robbie Silverman. I am a stand-up comedian and a writer, and I also have done a little bit of on-camera work myself. I actually just recently wrapped a shoot for Take My Wife on CISO, and I've appeared on Not State with Nikki Glaser, and so I'm trying myself to be someone who is part of this, this group of trans performers who are out there representing, and yeah, that's me. Uh, my name is Rachel Crowell, actor. I am in Tomorrow's and then there was Eve. My name is Candace Kane. I'm an actress, uh, performer, and now author. My first book is coming out on Tuesday, so I'm really excited about that. Um, I am a typical girl living in Los Angeles, going for auditions and, you know, trying to make my mark on this world as an open trans actress. Hi, I'm Sean Dasani. I'm an actor uh, and was a filmmaker before that. Actually, uh, alumni of Project Involved through Film Independent, which is a great program. And so it's kind of awesome to be back here in this capacity. I started acting uh, after I started physically transitioning. And uh, it's been an amazing process and journey. I'm non-union, just recently found out I was SAG eligible. So uh, doing my best to um, learn from the examples before me and keep pushing the conversation forward by being visible. Great. I'm Mickey Delmonico. I'm a writer-director. Um, I transitioned while I was making my first feature film, Alto. That was an experience. Um, <laughs> two girls, one gun, the mob. Uh, so <laughs> anyway, I also came out to my family at the same time um, as transgender, and I had an experience that I, I feel is useful to share with other people, and so I'm glad to be here, and thank you for asking me. Hi, I'm Mari Walker. I'm a writer, director, producer. I actually have a film that showed uh, on Thursday, a short film called Swim. It's about a young trans girl who goes on the secret midnight swim in her family's backyard over her summer vacation. And uh, I've just done films for about a decade now. I direct uh, documentaries, and I'm moving my way into doing narrative uh, pieces now, and obviously a lot of pieces that relate to trans visibility and filmmakers and actors and actresses. It's all just wonderful. Great, thank you all very much for joining us today and thank you all for coming. And so we'll start off, in 2014, Time Magazine ran this article with Laverne Cox on the cover and they declared that year to be the trans tipping point. So yeah. I just wanted to begin with your opinions. In the last three years, like how much progress has been made since that tipping point? And have we, have we moved forward a lot? Have we moved backwards? And just like, did we cross a threshold as a country? for trans representation? Well, I think the tipping point had a lot to do with the idea that producers, directors, writers could start uh, creating characters for trans people. I think that's where it all starts, really. I mean, when I first started, there were no trans characters. Um, you know, when I first started transitioning, the T wasn't even in the LG and the B. Yeah. So um, we're just, it's slowly, we're it's slowly getting better, but we're at that tipping point where people are starting to see characters that are trans and starting to like familiarize themselves with them, I think. I agree with that. I, it's, yeah, it's not like there's like a snap of a finger and now all of a sudden we're just there. Uh, it is a process and I think we're still like in the thick of that process and um, it does take involving trans people in the writing of the story as well, in the development of the story. And I think once uh, we're able to do that, then it just improves the process. It feels like we're taking steps yeah. backwards, but we're not. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was back in Appleton, Wisconsin, and I, um, I got invited to meet this young 14-year-old trans girl who was transitioning to be the first trans person at her high school. And that, to me, seemed like an impossibility, even three years ago. Um, and yet there she was, ready to do it, and people were sort of accepting her, and it was actually going okay. And this is northern Wisconsin, not like some place that you think is some hotbed of progressivism. Yeah. But she was there. She was there killing it, do, take, you know, taking names, kicking ass, and doing the, right, doing the thing. And I, I see things like that, and I think, look at, look, at, look at what her mom is doing and her family. They're all being incredibly supportive in her school. And it's like, how are you going to take that back? How are you going to put that genie back in the bottle? Yeah. It isn't going to happen. I didn't tell my parents who I was until I was like in my late 20s, or early 30s. So for like these teenagers to be able to do it, is, that is a definitely a huge step forward. So I appreciate you bringing that up. So Candace, I wanted to ask you, so how do you feel, like do you think the I Am Kate series, do you think it really helped the conversation on a national level? Do you think that it was a positive gain? or is it, How do you feel about that? 
No, I think it was an incredible game. Yeah. I think it issued the word trans on the lips of the entire world as opposed to pockets around America and different viewing centers. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. we have, there, it was a crazy show and we had some, you know, really weird moments. And, mm -hmm. you know, we are in a really decisive political arena right now in, our, in the United States. And so being uh, so political on that show, it didn't really help the, the pro, you know, the, the word of the trans goals, you know what I mean? Everybody focused on Caitlin's a Republican as opposed to trans rights and, um, you know, doing great things around the world. I mean, the show was aired in 140 countries or something in 70 different languages. I mean, it was being aired in Africa where it's still illegal to be LGBT. So, I mean, it was doing major yeah. positive steps in the world, I think. Yeah, I know my mom, my mom doesn't have Netflix or Amazon or anything, so like that was the show. Like my mom, my mom wanted to talk to me about TV that she thought would relate to me, that's what she would bring up to me in conversation. So that's how I view it. And I think having people like you on there to give other points of views of the trans identity is really important to it, personally. We all were so different, and we all had our own point of view and the way we live our life. And, and that was important to me, that, that the show show that we are a diverse community. We're not a carbon copy of, of one kind of trans person. You know what I mean? We, uh, there was a lot of diversity on that show. My wife always says, um, if you've met one trans person, you've met one trans person. Yeah. <laughs> Which is actually genuine, it's, it's true. It's like, that was to me what I thought was so valuable We're about We're just such show. a small community that, that we really want to get things right. And so I think mm -hmm. people panic that somebody's not saying the right thing or, or using the right words. And so our community might attack that person as opposed to like, we're out there, we're, we're making strides, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think that's very um, important to note. It's also, it's such a new thing, I think, to be visible in the media as a trans person. I think for a lot of us, um, let me just go back to speaking for myself. But, uh, you know, I, I was in isolation during transition and like even getting comfortable speaking to friends and family about being a trans person and finding the language and then the language keeps changing and now all of a sudden it's like, oh, there's visibility and you have to know everything and know how to speak and advocate for the community. I mean, it's a learning process and I think uh, that's really important to keep in mind. I think that we need to acknowledge and talk about the fact that at this very festival we have a film screening tonight that is once again falling into the trope of having a cis male actor play a trans woman. The producers of Anything, which is screening later today, were invited to be on this panel and they declined for various reasons, but which I think may actually allow us to have a more like in-depth conversation from our points of view. So I think it might be better personally that they didn't, but uh, that's my own opinion. That's not the festival's opinion. And so I just wanted to talk, like, what do you guys feel about that this is still happening? We've had this conversation for every movie that's come out in the last several years that's dealt with this with Danish Girl and, and Dallas Buyers Club, and to some degree with Transparent, although that's, they're trying their best to kind of offset the karma for their decisions, but at what point are we done with the karma? I, I, I can talk about it all day, so I'm not gonna keep rambling, but I wanna hear everyone else's thoughts on it. I have a lot to say, so. It has to do with who's behind the camera as well, and who's doing the writing, and who's doing the directing, and that's a, you know, you were talking about Wonder Woman, and how it was directed by a woman, and how that made a big difference in what you saw on the screen, and I think that's true as well for, um, any film or or story with trans characters as well. Yeah, I I think it's it's a big it's a big challenge. A couple of years ago, one of my favorite movies was Tangerine, and I love that movie. I mean, that movie is incredible, and and there's certain moments in it that really speak to like experiences that I've had. Um, and then I showed my mom that, and she said there was too much yelling. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then I showed her the Danish girl, and she broke down in tears and said that she understood me better. And it was like one of those like really like challenging moments because for me that movie was very divisive, very frustrating, particularly in the way that like femininity was treated. I think um, you know I think there's like a, a hypersexualization that tends to come from a lot of cisgendered performers when it comes to this. I think that uh, just because of our culture, it's just like the we, because we sexualize women, like that's the way that they feel that they should be portraying the character. Um, so I, I think it's, it's frustrating like watching that sort of stuff and not seeing like 
uh, as we were saying, like sort of the full range of the community represented, it seems like that's sort of the only trope that seems to follow these uh, these performers, unfortunately. And, and a lot of that's the direction. A lot of that's because there aren't trans people that are writing or directing or, or able to like explain that experience in a way that's like, no, like when you're putting on a dress, it's not like, you know, you're like, <gasps> you know, it's just like you're, you're putting on a dress because you just feel normal and it feels nice and you feel like relaxed finally. And relaxation, I think, is like a really hard thing for a lot of these performers to like reach. And also because they're, they feel uncomfortable wearing these outfits and for them it's not it's not a normal thing and so then like they're automatically uncomfortable which is the diametrically opposite to how they should be feeling within that moment at least in my opinion it's also mostly like you said cis writers that are writing these parts so they don't understand what trans people go through and i mean for me personally yes i mean i all of those films that you talked about i was never called in for an audition i was never asked to even try to be in one of those films they didn't so, have auditions they just offered the part to an actor exactly. they could sell it with so yeah. for me i'm not really behind it i i feel like you know we have a, a we have a really good well of great actors in our community that could play these roles and if you want a lead huge star cast the 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 other lead in it you know what i mean yeah. it's I think it's it's time. How many times do we have to have this conversation? I mean, it's over and over and over again. It feels like what happens is we have the conversation with like one set of producers and filmmakers, and then they go, well, now we're having the conversation, and then they move on and never talk about it again. And then a new set of filmmakers come in, and then we have to have the exact same conversation we already had, and it's like a weird like carousel of just repeat. How many of us just have our talking points ready to go at this point? Because we've had to have them so many times. Like it's always like, well, they just hired the best actor for the part. I'm like, no, they hired the only actor they knew to do it. Like they didn't look for actor. Like. Like I said, I have a lot to say about it. I could talk about it myself in an hour, so I'm, I won't do that. But you mentioned, Mari, the performance, and I, th I think you did, or maybe it was Mickey, but the, Jen Richards had a great quote yesterday in a piece she wrote about anywhere where, or anything where she said that when you hire a cis actor to play a trans woman, the cis actor is acting trans, whereas when you hire a trans actor, they're acting like the character. And I think that's yeah. what sums it up for me. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I, I think that it's... It's, it's a full embodiment, it, you know, I mean, it's the same thing, I'm sure for, you know, like, I mean, the, the frustration I think that we're facing now is I, I, I sense sort of what like a lot of the other parts of the community, the gay and lesbian sort of com part of the community like had to deal with almost like a decade ago, where it's like a lot of straight actors were playing queer characters and it's like, you know. Still and, are. And yeah, it's still, they still are. And, and, and w for some, I feel like it's it's funny in its own way because that's almost become more accepted. Um, but in a lot of ways, I also like relate being trans a lot more to like in some ways like race because it's such an outward exterior experience versus like where if you're, you know, if you're gay or lesbian or bisexual, you can be in the closet in certain circumstances. You know what I mean? So I feel like in a lot of ways, like it's it's a lot more of an extreme thing for people to become accustomed to. Which is frustrating because it's like we're all just human beings and we're all just lovely people, but you know, it's uh, it's it's hard for some people to accept that. I think too, um, there are so many resources. Um, there's Glad, uh, and now there's Transgender Talent, which is a talent agency representing trans and gender nonconforming individuals. Um, there are ways that I think filmmakers can find out how to get trans people involved. There are lots of clear, lots of trans performers and lots of um, trans and gender non-conforming folks uh, that have been working in different crew positions. Um, recently, I think just a couple months ago, Actors Access, which is a big casting site, uh, now has an option where someone can yes. disclose themselves as trans, but it's not necessarily the thing that will show up on their profile, so they can also audition for other roles, but if someone is casting for a trans person, they can hit a search filter and they can see people who identify as trans and gender non-conforming. So I think there are like positive steps being taken um, and we're, we're moving in that direction, but yeah, we're, we've still got a long ways to go. Yeah, I was going to say, I think that's one of the most important things that we can all do here today for, for all these people out here is just making sure that they understand where the resources are, because I think a lot of times, like, when we're, we're coming in and we're going to these, like, maybe, you know, these great professional, like, you know, circumstances and productions and casting and all that, and, and I think a lot of times, like, the, the smaller sort of more boutique instances of this get lost in sort of the, the larger shuffle. And it's important for people to be aware of these. Just out of curiosity, so how many filmmakers are in the audience? We had 
So we got a number of filmmakers here. Uh, so, and I think like in anything that someone's researching, I think film is such like a powerful medium. We're telling stories, sometimes they're based on our personal experience and sometimes they're not. And when they're not, we research. And yeah, I think you're right. We have like tons of resources out there. So I think if it's important to do the research and involve, like if you're telling a story about somebody that, or a character that that's not your personal experience, like do the research and get, get folks involved with your storytelling process. We're in Los Angeles and we've got things at our fingertips, so. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to give a shout out to my filmmakers, my director and producers who went the extra mile to find me. Um, they were about ready to push production because they still hadn't found a trans woman to play the trans woman. And I, I really applaud that. They're cis people and they're wonderful cis people. Um, but they did the research. They really worked hard. They did the extra mile. They really, really tried to do the right thing. And I feel like I want to I wanna reward that too, right? Because I want to see more of us behind the camera, but right now, I want to reward the people who are doing the right thing. I want to like publicly shout out Savannah and Jen and Jen and say, you know, that's amazing what you did. Because, yeah, getting into this idea of Matt Bomer playing a woman, because she's a woman who's trans is the way I think of it. Um, you know, when you're acting, you're, you're, you're relying on your instincts and you just want to play the role. But when you're, you're doing something akin to what I think is sort of, at this point, it's like blackface. Um, you're adding a whole new level to playing this character. So you're not just playing the character, you also have to like figure out like how to play a trans person too. Yeah. And that's like an extra layer to the performance that doesn't need to be there, especially when there are folks here on the stage who could do it. Um, and that gets in the way. And you get, more, you get a more authentic performance because someone like myself doesn't have to sort of go through well, now I need to research what it must be like to be trans, right? Um, and you, I think you get more authentic performances. I agree totally. And I, I like to hear what you said about your, the producers, when they had not found you yet, that their instinct was, well, we have to push production, as opposed to what I think happens more often, which is, let's just hire a cis person. And, and then they can go, oh, it was easier that way. Like, I've had that argument in my face so many times. And people are like, well, our budget was low, and we had to film, and we couldn't find anybody. And I'm like, well, you, there's people. We're out there. Like, We're out we, like there. you know me. You could have called me. Like, I would have, you know, that kind of thing. So it, I'm glad to hear that even before they found you, they were like, we have to do it this way. And I think that needs to be consider the norm. Like, if you can't do it right, then you should wait till you can. So I've spent the last eight years working at a liberal arts college in Wisconsin. Um, I have been away from acting for 12 years. Um, and I've, you know, my wife and I are like the visibly queer people in Appleton. And that means that we sort of become the queer ants to all the queer kids, <laughs> which is awesome. But it also means that I've actually really got to experience the younger generations, the way they see these things. And they see these things as, I, the blackface comment doesn't come from me, it comes from this young trans student that I know, who was like, that's like blackface. And I hadn't even thought of that at that point. But it is, it's not, we're not going to ask Tom Hanks to play, you know, uh, Martin Luther King. We'd all be like, that's ridiculous. But the thing is, is that I feel like the industry- Although Matt Damon can play Chinese warrior, apparently. Yeah, well, Let's, you know, like, well, Matt Damon, like, he can do anything. I, I think there's that. plenty of Asians in the audience who would tell you, well, yeah, he can't, that's the Matt problem. <laughs> like, there is definitely a huge problem still with whitewashing Asian characters as well. Oh, so it's yeah, like a huge, exactly. Yeah. But that, that idea of like, you know, the demographics of the audience, our audience is changing. Our, our, our younger generations are savvy, they are smart, they are experiencing peak TV. They also are looking for authentic representations that reflect the people they know in their life. A lot of younger people have queer friends. They have gay and lesbian friends. They have trans friends. They have gender non-conforming friends. And so when they see somebody like Matt Bomer get up and do this, their kind of instinct is to be like, what? How, what? That's just wrong. It doesn't even look right. <laughs> and then after that, you know, when, when they're out doing publicity, you don't have a woman getting up doing publicity yes. for the thing. You've got a dude doing publicity for the thing, and it just, as Jen Richards has said over and over and over again, it sort of reinforces this idea in an unconscious way that, that you and I are dudes. Yeah, exactly. It's like, I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it does. And so, you know, it's hard, you know, like I'm sure the economics of the industry are such that they were like, well, if we get Matt Boomer, we'll get the extra financing because name. Well, you know, you're gonna have to give some of us some chances so that we can become names.
Yeah, and also like the whole name thing is such a weird argument because there's other ways to promote films besides having a name. Like the year that Dallas Buyers Club came out, Jared Leto, the big argument was, well, they needed to get him to get awards buzz. Well, the same year, we had two supporting actor nominees for Oscars who had never been in a movie before, and they both got nominated for an Oscar, you know, from, from Captain Phillips and also 12 Years a Slave. We had two actors of color who were both amazing, and so, like, we, why couldn't we have found the trans person that would have been the Jared Leto's version of that? Like, what? That's, yeah. Also, I was just going to say, you know, when, when we're talking about a tipping point, like, what is on the other side of the tipping point? I mean, are we really going up? I, I just think that's an odd way to, t to reference it. But I do think we have to have a bigger conversation about um, the economics of, of filmmaking, mm -hmm. um, because we all know it does take a lot of money. Uh, filmmakers out here know it takes a lot of money to make something. And um, that is an argument that's going to come up over and over and over. So I don't know, I, you know, I don't have an answer. I just know it, it needs to be part of the conversation. When someone makes a bad decision for a commerce reason, is that still not worth criticizing? No, I definitely think we should criticize it. And, and you know, I'm not motivated by money, but I know that a lot of people are who are having this conversation. And so when we, we bring it up, I think we need to bring it up in a way that does address that, address their concerns so that we hear what, what they're saying. Um, and I agree with you. We have yeah. to put people in so that we, they can become names. And I wasn't challenging you directly on that. I was just, oh, you, that thought reminded me of that point. You, you yeah. could, though. That's, <laughs> Listen. that's why we have a panel. <laughs> Every time I hear you, that argument, you know, we had to get Jared Leto because it would help with the financing, I think. You had Matthew McConaughey. Yeah, and Amy Adams. <laughs> you had names. You could have actually taken a chance on this one. You, you had Matthew fucking McConaughey, for God's yeah. sake. Well, it's, it's, also right? like, it's also like no a domestic versus is. international t situation, too. It's like, uh, you know, a lot of these names, like Jared Leto is not someone who internationally would do particularly well, so it's like you can't even make that yeah. argument of like, oh, we can you know, sell it internationally like with a Matthew McConaughey sort of, sort of figure. And it wasn't like Jared Leto was this bankable star then. The last movie he'd right. been in was like Panic Room. So it's right. not like, like, oh, the guy from 30 Seconds to Mars? Yeah, we've got to go see that movie he's in. Like, it was definitely, they were clearly marketing it with the like, almost like freak show elements well, of what if Jared Leto looks like a woman in this movie? Well, like, but also, like, the, the problem I had with that movie really goes back to the writing. Um, there was just a lot of confusion about her character, I feel like. Like, they misgendered her a lot. They, like, kind of swung back and forth as to, like, why she was transitioning and all these things. And, and the frustrating thing for me about that movie is, like, that script had been around for, like, 15 years. I mean, they hold the whole, like, story about, like, oh, it took so long to make this movie. I'm like, it took you so long to make this movie that you probably never had a trans person read it and say, hold on a minute, like, this doesn't make sense, this doesn't make sense, and this doesn't make sense. And that's the, fr like, Jared Leto doesn't know. He's coming on set. He's like, oh, I'm going to, like, perform in this thing. And I talked to a couple of trans people, and I think I, get the, I got the picture figured out. He but spent it's like two weeks in immersive training, so I think he knows oh, where I'm he, so I'm sorry. <laughs> my, apology, my apologies, Jared. That's all he went to about. Whole Foods in a dress, and they looked at him weird. So I think he knows no, what he's I, talking about. It's, it's frustrating because it's like that stuff could have been remedied, and it would have been at least if not a more accurate trans performance, at least a more accurate trans character. And it, it was just infuriating for me to watch that, where it's just like, you guys had all this time and all these resources probably at your disposal, probably people coming up to you and saying, you know, like, we've read the script and we have these issues, but it, it just never felt addressed. I, I, would, I would like to say, you know, um, I have nothing against Jared Leto or Eddie Redmayne or Same. Matt Bomer. They're all terrifically talented actors. And, and I, I, I actually absolutely acknowledge that. I just happen to think that because our brains are amazing, we can hold more than one thought in it at the same time, yeah. which is that, you know, you, you're, they're actors at heart, and the job of acting is to play the character, right? And if you do it honestly and honestly and truthfully, well, that's a success to some degree. But I also think it's possible to hold in your mind at the same point in time I really would have liked to have seen a trans person do it instead. Like, I don't want to sound like I'm slagging off on these people because they're really talented and they gave, I haven't seen anything, but these people have given really amazing performances and I don't want to take away from that. It's just, I don't want to see them doing it anymore. Yeah, I feel the same way. Do you think it's possible for a cisgender actor to play a trans character with a full complexity? Do you think it's possible at all for it to happen? Maybe pre-transition, but once you start transitioning, it's just it's just it's an impossible thing for me in my in my mind. I mean, it's like how do you how do you go method rehearse two years of being misgendered or that period of time where nobody knows what your gender is, 
or the moments where people call you names? Like, how do you method well, rehearse any of that? Or, or even yeah. going through puberty again. And right. like and like having all these feelings that like all all of your friends were like yeah I felt that like years ago and I'm just like oh, I'm just going through this thing I don't know you know so it's like I liked you, so much I did it twice <laughs> right yeah. how many times does the transgender story on TV or film have to be a transition story before we can maybe move on and have other things? like like that's look it's interesting we we all go through it and it's it's a fascinating point in our lives but we also was it's there's way more to being a trans person in the world than the couple of years that you're on hormone therapy or waiting for surgery or even if, even if you're going to get surgery like my favorite trans representation in the last year was a very small part it was on crazy ex girlfriend and it was Michelle Henley who was in the movie boy meets girl and she's literally in one scene, and she's just selling hallucinogenic teas at a music festival. And she has like, like a few lines, I only know she's trans because I know who the actor is. But it wasn't written as a trans character, it was just, we hired an actor. And that's, for me, before I pass it to you guys, if you're a filmmaker in the room, that's what I think you should be considering moving forward making films. Like, you don't necessarily need to tell explicitly trans stories all the time, you just need to include trans voices in your stories that already exist. It's funny, I just, I just had to say this because like, I'm, my family's from India, I was born and raised in North Carolina of all places. But um, in the 90s there were uh, several independent films uh, about South Asian identity in America and all the Indians were like, oh yeah, there's finally an Indian movie, Indian movie, you know, and it was all about identity. And after like three or four of the same films, it was like, okay, it's not just about, you know, we've got other stories beyond just living in America and as an immigrant and trying to blend into the society and all that stuff. So I, I kind of like feel like we're in that space right now with the trans narrative. Um, but yeah, there is, there's so much more to tell actually. Um, so uh, Mickey and I have been working together on a project too. I know part of the conversation also is also the invisibility of trans men in the story, in, in sure. the overall landscape. Um, so uh, we're developing a story ourselves and, and we think that's part of the um, part of the solution is trans people writing the narratives. Because if cisgender people are only writing the narratives, they're gonna connect with that most fascinating bit. And it's the same questions that I think we get asked as people when we may disclose that we're trans, like questions about how our family took it and what that process was like, and people get like really latch on to that part of the story. I think that's why, that's a lot of what we're seeing right now. Um, but I think it does take trans people to really like tell stories outside of that narrative because we know how complex the experience is. It's a, it's a salaciousness of it all, you know. I think that like it's it's a just you know it's it's sort of in the same way that I feel like a lot of like yeah those you know minority communities when they start making films it like sticks on certain like aspects of the community and it gets stuck there. And I think like part of that is like when we when that stuff starts getting into more of the mainstream, then you just see like the sort of the cisgendered filmmakers like taking on those sorts of stories and those sorts of mantles, but I think it's also important for people within the community to tell these different types of stories because, uh, you know, Swim has played at a number of really wonderful festivals. We played at, you know, like international festivals. We played at LGBTQIA festivals. And it's just interesting because we've gotten in a series of blocks and it's like even within like the community, it's like, you know, they, they were just the, sort of the same stories. It was like either coming out or it was death. And it's like, and then like there's like this weird like sandwiched in there, there's like this little like coming of age trans story, but it's like this, but it's this thing where it's like, even within that, it's like we're still falling within, and I see that in every minority community, it's like we fall into the same pattern of telling the same stories, and we just need to like push ourselves and then also like hopefully influence the larger community. It would be nice to see a story of somebody waking up like we all do every day and don't go to our trans blog and call yeah. our friends about our trans issues. Like, we live a nice, screen. full life. Trans is not on our lips 24-7. Eating our trans, trans coffee. Meals. You know, you're making trans coffee. And our trans yeah. cat. Yeah. We're like, hi, nice to meet you. I'm trans. I mean, cat it's is like neutered, it might a be. Story, a story, a love story where it's like, okay, yes, this person's trans, but then what? Yeah. You know what I mean? Mickey and Sean, you brought up a point that I, I wanted to address. So do you, as, as trans men, do you feel as frustrated when you see female actors playing male char trans male characters as we do when we, like, is it, is it as harmful to your side of the community as it is for us? Because, like, Jen Richards has said flat out, and I don't disagree with her, that casting cis men to play a trans woman, at least right now in our current culture, leads to assaults and death of trans women. And I... I, I, her through line is very solid, and I believe her, but do you have the same feeling of like frustration and rage towards it? 
Well, on, on the one hand, um, there is that feeling of like, oh, there is some trans male representation out there somewhere because it is so infrequent, um, even in the magazines and, and also um, in film. But um, yeah, I mean, I, Sean here is a great actor and I would love to see him and other people getting more, more roles uh, for trans. But again, I mean, I think the narrative is broader and mm -hmm. we, um, we as trans men have a responsibility to kind of tell our, our part. You know, I don't, I don't blame other people. I think we need to, get, you know, tell our part. I had a casting director a couple of months ago who brought me in for an audition. She was like, it's, it's just an angry, crazy professor. There's no gender with this character. And so I'm like, she was like, I thought, why not? We should absolutely put you in the mix. And that's the attitude, because I'd love to play a crazy, angry professor. Yeah. <laughs> Eight years at a college, I know that type. Um, <laughs> But I loved the idea of it. Like, my, of all the auditions I've done, which haven't been many because it's hard to get them because people sometimes just go, oh, well, this isn't a trans character. And I'm like, well, you know what? I can play anybody. I want to be a Marvel supervillain tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, for me doing The Magicians, it was just fairy queen. It's not a trans fairy. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, <laughs> exactly. a lot of steps there. I have to and go in so my head. So, a lot, Wait. most, I mean, the, the, the people that I work with, my publicist, my, you know, agent, I've said to them, like, send me out for non trans roles and trans roles. I don't mind, but there are roles that are available that are the, you know, the sexy neighbor. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and so. We got you on the sexy neighbor thing. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say uh, just a, a nod out to our allies as well. Um, while I was shooting in the film, uh, my producer, Catherine McEwen, who's here in the audience right now, very, like, that was one of the conversations that we had is, like, we're just really hoping for the day when, like, we could just cast trans people in just roles of just characters, and it just doesn't have to be that, that identifier. It gets back to the idea of the younger audiences. They have trans friends. They don't think about it as, yep. like, oh, wow, we're going to have crazy, sexy talk about your genitals for an hour. Like, it's just my buddy. Well, maybe maybe your friends. I, well, they might because, well, they're horny as hell, aren't they? Um, but no, I mean, that, I really think that's a thing that filmmakers should be thinking about is that your audience actually is experiencing a world that they know people like us and we're just friends and neighbors and lovers and husbands and wives and girlfriends and boyfriends and aunts and uncles and all of that stuff. Yeah. And I, you know, I think that's like, you know, why can't we play crazy, angry professors or sexy neighbors? And everything that we do as trans producers, writers, actors, is actually pushing society forward. So it might feel like a struggle a lot, but if you think about it, there are people all over the world that see these little parts and these things that we're doing, and it, it does create the change that's needed. How do you feel about, though, the element that I brought up about Jen Richards saying that trans women being played by cis men leads to directly to assaults and murders. Like, is that something you feel as strongly about? In, in a lot of people's eyes still, trans means, you know, oh, that, that's just somebody who's male or female trying to be something that they're not. And so that narrative, yes, is harmful. In, in, in I think so. It's hard to quantify, too, because as trans visibility has risen what's the right word um there's been more reports of violence against the trans community but again i'm thinking how do we quantify that what was it before uh, how were people identified in articles before um but yes i do see it as problematic i mean yeah in, in some ways you can say that's an act of violence in itself to the community so um mm. but it, it is it's true it's hard to quantify i transitioned within a marriage so it's hard for me to say mm -hmm. um but I do think, once again, it's like, you know, you, when you see Jared Leto doing publicity for the film, you're seeing a dude doing publicity for the film. Yeah. And it does reinforce the idea that it's like, it's like playtime, it's like dress up, it's like Halloween. It's not it's a It's so brave. It's, oh yeah, it's yeah. so, you're so brave. Yeah. No, you're not. <laughs> I think that's a really important point, actually, because like, um, my, the film that I made was not, it didn't have trans, uh, you know, storyline. Um, but it was really important for me to go around to the different festivals as a trans director, a writer, and talk about that and, and let people know that we are out there doing other things as well. We're not just transitioning. Yeah. 
Yeah, I feel like you know we keep talking about this idea too of who's controlling the story. The only example we really have of like a really high level trans filmmaker are the Wachowski sisters, but they also had to make like multiple blockbuster films living as men before one of them came out and the other one comes out and then finally we get this Netflix series that got canceled the first day of Pride Month, which is great timing Netflix, good job. When do we finally like get the point where like you know, we have, it was sponsored by HBO, it was sponsored by Fox, like when did these companies that are like supposed to be known for bringing these bold voices out, like when did they take a chance on us? I asked a lot of things there, I'm sorry. No, um, I mean, hopefully. <laughs> Solve so all the problems I, I right now. I hope soon, I mean, I would love to see more trans filmmakers out there. We have some really great ones, Wachowskis, Sidney Freeland, all these really great filmmakers. Um, I think, I mean, I, I hope it's gonna happen. I mean, we were talking about Wonder Woman and seeing that perspective sort of shift and seeing these changes. I think that, that these voices are really important. I think that, like, in my experience of, of dealing with people within the industry, I haven't had that many problems. Um, more of my problems is related to the fact that now I'm a woman, and I think that, like, in their eye, and I think that that, like, that in itself is almost, like, the bigger issue for me right now than the trans issue. I feel like it's just because a lot of times we're not heard, and it's very frustrating at meetings when people talk over you, and you're like, I didn't know your name was Mari, you know? My name's Mari. Your name's, you know, Jake. I don't know why you're answering my question, but sure, like, whatever, guys. <laughs> Um, so I, I think that, you know, there, there is that, that challenge. I think that, um, you know, a, a lot of these, like, uh, like Project Involve, all these different things are helpful, I think, in terms of getting more diverse voices out there. Um, and I think we'll probably see that title shift within probably the next decade. I think, like, our generation, like, moving forward, I think is, it's a lot more diverse than, than maybe previous, certainly, filmmaking, directing generations. And also, I think we don't talk a lot about mentoring, um, but you know, people tend to mentor people who remind them of themselves. Mm -hmm. And if there's not that many people, you know, trans people in positions of power, that's really problematic um, because it doesn't help the gen next generation who are trying to to um, learn. How much of what we're talking about really isn't just specifically like a trans or queer element, but a patriarchal element of like the old boys club of what Hollywood is? Like, you know, oh, yeah. look, Elizabeth Banks's quote was problematic and very erasing of women of color and like it's a problem. But when you talk about like Steven Spielberg outside of his casting choices, I, I love Spielberg's work. I think he makes fantastic movies, but like the people he chooses to to give producer work to or to make movies for are people like Brad Bird and Colin Trevorrow, like people who look a lot like him and remind him of him. Like at what point do we need to like be more demanding of people who are famous but are like power holders, directors, producers to step up to the plate more? I, I think that there's been some movement towards that. Um, I uh, I heard that during an interview for the Book of Henry, there was a talk with Colin Trevorrow, and one of the things that they talked about was like women, female directors, and why there's such a lack of, and he said that they're part of the problem. He's like, people within the industry like need to start stepping up, and he's like mentoring a few young female filmmakers, which is just wonderful. I'm st I feel like we're starting to see a little bit of that shift, but it definitely is. It's like the, the patriarchal, older generation that's just constantly handing it down to their I mean, you see it in every in every system in every industry, but particularly in film, it's bad and it's frustrating because I feel like Hollywood has this like veneer of like, oh, we're so progressively minded, we have all these things, but really, when you start digging into the industry, it's it's the same thing as anywhere else in any you know financial industry, whatever. I mean, I've seen like a like a very direct correlation to my gender presentation uh, and the the help that I may receive from uh, men in particular. So presenting either as gender non-conforming or female, it was, okay, it, you know, that's all I knew at the time. And then post-transition, it's like all of a sudden I've got cis men coming up to me left and right. Let me help you out, buddy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and then it's like, okay, well, what do I do with that? You know, and just recognizing, okay, it is a whole other level of privilege. Like, um, as someone who has trained as a filmmaker, as a storyteller, like what can I do to bring that into my work and give opportunities to other people? Um, it's very real, male pri privilege is very real. I think it's interesting that, so last year at the Oscars, we had this huge Oscar so white response because it was such a whitewashed Oscars. And then directly in response to that, the, M the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences changed their rules about who is allowed into the Academy. And like, it's kind of like, there were people like Billy Mummy who are still voting on, like, look, I like Twilight Zone a lot, but Billy Mummy does not need me voting on who's best picture last year. In the, like, it's just like a thing 
because it was such a limited pool of people who were voting, and so many of them looked the same and were entrenched. I think at one point it was like 93% white. Just like. Yeah, like no matter how diverse the industry is getting, the people who were voting for awards were not part of that diversity. And now, here we are a year later, and that change you know, has not been dramatically changed yet, but just in the shifting in the last year, look at how much Moonlight won Best Picture this year. Like, that's a year later. So do we think that, because awards are very important for independent films. Like, it's a big thing towards getting budget and getting, like, prestige and, like, getting a bigger distribution. So do you think, like, just we're already beginning to see, like, how that's going to be a major change in the next decade or so? I would just speak careful to keep in mind that we still have to be vigilant about it. Oh, sure, I'm not no, saying, I know, I know, yeah. you know, but I just, I just think that it's one of those things where it's like, it's easy to look at like this huge sort of coup, I mean, beyond like all the craziness that happened that night. Uh, Why, what happened? So, yeah, <laughs> nothing, nothing big, nothing big, just a little misreading, but um, no, I mean, I, I think that um, even amongst the programming of this year, I mean, I sort of the, uh, what we were talking earlier about sort of the election, the results of the election, and I have read that there has been sort of like a backwards trend even amongst programs that are being, you know, greenlit or not, you know, and a lot of it sort of they're like, oh, you know, we need to start, you know, going back to the Midlands, you know, into the Midwest and start like telling these stories um, because they feel underrepresented because of the success of, of Trump. And, and so I think it's, you know, we had this like huge, I mean, like last year was just so awesome. Like, I mean, Mahershala and all these, I mean, just like some of my favorite people won, which is just wonderful. But I think we, we do need to keep an eye out and make sure that like we keep on putting the pressure onto these systems and these institutions oh, sure. because otherwise like it will just slide right back and, and it'll, before we even know it. Well, and keep getting better at the craft, whether we're actors like train, whether you're filmmakers, develop that crap learn the numbers learn you know if you're a producer like get better at you know and it, yes it's not just about that but i think it's also it's also about that it's about being vocal and vi being visible and being an advocate and it's also about being educated and developing our our talents yeah and that's where awards actually do you know have something to do with you're making the next film like you've made one film what what happens after yeah I was just going to say something, too, that was kind of frustrating about that in particular was that when La La Land was, like, leading in terms of the Oscars for Best Picture, I heard so many, like, rumors about, oh, this five new musicals are coming out. Like, oh, it's just going to revolutionize musicals. And then Moonlight came out, and I haven't heard anything like that. For, and that movie's amazing. That movie's incredible. And, like, we need more movies like that. So it's just frustrating for me to, like see this like groundswell movement happen with this sort of mainstreamified whatever musical thing but then when this like great film ends up winning it's like we don't hear any of that conversation i mean it's, it's frustrating think about how many more movies you could make for the budget of la la land if you're gunning for awards for those kind of things to make money back or if you're just gunning for one movie to hit big and make back your investment if you make four movies that are all like very different and insightful and, and have like a point of view and one of them hits you've made back what you've spent on like multiple movies as opposed to having to have one movie big be hit big and just take over well i think that's one of the bigger concerns and issues with the industry now is we're basically like the mid the mid budgeted feature just does no longer exists i mean anything from like 25 to like 75 is a real stretch because they think that they're just not going to make enough of a return on their investment and it's like this, this cycle that we've gotten caught up in where it's like it is that thing where it's like if they actually spent the four moon bodies instead of the one La La Land, they might actually make more of a profit. But it's like someone just has to like, some studio has to take that risk. Yeah. Because like right now it's just like they're falling back into like, well, no one else is doing it. You know, it's the same thing with female filmmakers and like female superheroes. Well, Catwoman was bad. I was like, Catwoman was like a decade ago. And yes, it was terrible, but it's also kind of brilliant. Yeah, so was Daredevil and Ben Affleck but, is still getting cast in things. So. But, you know, but it's frustrating because it's like it had to take Wonder Woman. Now they're like, oh, it made all this money. Well, geez, you know, and it's like, yeah, and sometimes you just have to incentivize those people. You have to be like, look, you're losing out on all this money. Like, sorry, guys. And then, you know, oh, no. You know, and then that's when they'll get but I also think that if you have if you have the fortune to be uh, to have a really killer experience, like my my film in Nine Was Eve, our entire camera crew was female, and this was my first movie, so I didn't really realize the import of that. But I had some was some dude on set who was like, you know, see that? I've never seen that before. I've never ever seen that before. That's really cool. And I feel like every time I get a chance to talk about the film, I want to talk about how many amazing women were working on it because. I fully expect my next film to be like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm probably gonna be sadly mistaken, but for a first time experience, it was amazing, because it was like, 
everybody on that crew was like, it was a, we, everybody was lifting each other up. And it was a really amazing experience to be a part of. Yeah. So I feel like when we do have good experiences, I want to make sure that like, we're shouting out, like, ah, that was an amazing experience. You should know how amazing the experience was. Because we, we're in this time where we want to talk about female filmmakers all the time, and I, which we should. Um, and I feel like the way to think about this whole diversity thing is like, let's take all that passion for female filmmakers and let's just expand it a little bit and make it a slightly bigger tent and just be like, let's, let's just celebrate non-straight non white dude filmmakers. If you had to say like one quick thing as a parting assignment to give to these people who are in the audience and you had like give them a, a task to, to move forward, like what would it be? So Mario, I'll start with you and we'll work our way down the... I think just look into the resources and look at the people and, and the communities around you and just try to incorporate as much diversity as possible. You know, the more voices that you have that are unique and individual, uh, the greater your film will be. So just always keeping that in mind. And actually don't worry about asking dumb questions. I mean... I'm I did a bunch to today. Them. Yeah, so. any questions, good. <laughs> See, I do it all the time. Um, be truthful in your storytelling, and also that you're here, I think, says a lot about who you are. Um, so corny as it sounds, don't ever give up on who you are, because I think it's, it's easy. I mean, it's easy to feel dejected and rejected and all kinds of stuff, and it's not an easy road, but if, it's, if it matters to you, uh, keep going. Um, if you are uh, doing a, a movie or something with any trans character, hire trans writers. Um, include us in your your experience, and um, also, you know, like we talked about today, our transitions are long and vast. They're not the first two years, so there can be more stories told. Um, filmmaking is an inherently risky proposition, right? You all have been embracing risks just to, to make your art. So take an extra risk. You're already there. You're already risking a whole bunch. So why not embrace the risk? Take chances. We want to be named so that we can sort of, you know, take chances. You already are. Yeah, and I think the last thing about that is I think reward the people who are taking the risks. So, for example, go see... And then there was Eve tomorrow. Like, go see, a, go see a film. So, watch The Magicians. Watch Swim. What's your film? What, like, what are you guys work? What's what right now? Can I tell them to go see to check you out? Alto. Alto. Go see Alto. Alto. Check it out. It's on Amazon. Okay, there you go. Go to Amazon, watch Alto, and watch Take My Wife. Just do the things you can do to to support the people who are making the change, so that the people will go. Well, they're doing well with it. Maybe we can do more of that. Thank you all so much for being on the panel. You guys were amazing. Thank, thank you for you, turning up. And thank, thank you to the Roger. Film Festival for having us. And thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Yay.